Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Xiang Jingmo. I'm the director of, of operations at uh, SVA MFA Computer Arts Department. It's my pleasure to introduce you to today's presentation by Nickelodeon. Um, and first, I would like to thank the, thank the following departments for hosting today's event. And they are BFA Animation. You want to clap for your own department? Yes. <laughs> BFA Computer Art, Computer Animation, and Visual Effects. <laughs> That's good. Career Development. <laughs> <laughs> and MFA Computer Arts. <laughs> yes. Thank you. We're very lucky to have two representatives today. Um, then they're, they're actually working at two different locations, um, one in New York and one in Burbank, California. Um, so first, we have Mark Salisbury. He's uh, from the New York office. He's a multiple Emmy Award winning director. He's currently the supervising director for a new Nickelodeon series, Butterbeans Cafe, which is set to debut next year. So mark your calendar. Ooh. He began his career uh, in 1996 as a freelance animator before joining Nickelodeon in 1998. And I just found out the interesting story that he's going to share with you guys later about how he, you know, his career path. Because um, it's more interesting than my bio that I found. <laughs> uh, he's also a uh, SVA faculty for the BFA Computer Art, Computer Animation, and Visual Effects. And we also have studio recruiter from Burbank, California, Ariel Goldberg. Ooh, yes. Ariel joined Nickelodeon Animation Studio in 2015, and he had previously worked as a recruiter at Disney Interactive. He's also a creative artist himself. He was a 2D concept artist at Zynga, and also an animator, story, and viz dev artist. His background's in film and theater. <laughs> I like the cue. OK, great. Uh, he was just in Ottawa in, uh, animation inter uh, sorry, International Animation Festival last week, that which he met a lot of artists, and I'm hoping we'll have a lot of great artists from this view that he gets to meet today. Uh, so today's presentation is more like a conversation. Uh, Anna on the other side, and I'll be on this side handling the mic, so whenever you have a question, raise your hand and we'll come to you. So let's give these two a warm welcome, kind of like the weather today, um, <laughs> and welcome them to SVA and share their insights and experiences with us. So I don't know if you were prepared for this, but this is actually going to be super interactive uh, because the way we like to uh, chat with you guys is really with you guys and not at you guys. Um, and so I do have a deck here. It's probably going to be very, very sparsely used. <laughs> and um, really, we're going to, rather than do like 45 minutes of us talking and then a 15-minute Q&A, it's just going to be Q&A throughout. We would like you guys to set the tone of what you want us to talk about. Does that sound all right? Woo! Awesome. Great. Um, so um, we're going to keep Shang and Anna busy <laughs> running around the audience, um, extending cell, uh, cell phones, extending uh, microphones. Um, so please do raise your hands. And um, if you have questions, that's really what's going to set the pace. Um, and honestly, uh, everything is, uh, is on the table. Um, if there's stuff we can't talk about for NDA reasons, we won't. And, um, uh, but uh, if you want to hear about our careers, um, what you guys should be doing to build your careers, what a production is like, that, those, that question should really go to Mark over here, because he's the pro. Um, what I look for as a recruiter, anything and everything, please, please uh, ask. Um, so. Uh, let's uh, let's toss it to you guys. Who has a question? What do you look for when, when you're recruiting somebody? Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so uh, that's a that's a good question. It's a broad question, um, but um, I'll I'll talk about portfolio. How about that? Um, when I look for a portfolio and uh, or any or a real, uh, uh, and I want you to chime in here too, Mark. Yep. Um, I like to boil it down to two main things. Um, uh, I look for consistency of quality in the portfolio and relatability of content and visual style. Um, portfolio, real, 
um, all those things. So um, consistency of quality, you know, uh, let me throw this back to you guys. Do you think that you should start your portfolio with your best piece or end your portfolio with your best piece? Start with best piece, right? That's what everybody says. It's a trick question. Everything should be your best piece. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the other thing is uh, diversity in your work. Um, if you're lucky enough, you may get your own show, will be your own style, but I have yet to do this. I've been doing it for 20 some years, so I need to copy people's style and be able to mimic uh, their art direction and their either character design or background design. So being able to have a big wide range uh, is something I always look for. And this this can get a little confusing because I'm sure you've all heard at some point and will continue to hear, we want versatility in your work, we also want you to have your own voice, right? It's, it's actually not a contradiction in terms. Um, Mark's absolutely correct. You can have your voice and with that voice you can sing many different songs, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> to use a really, really corny analogy. Um, so, but, but it's true. I mean, you, you will have to work under someone's art direction or, or under a storyboard director, and they will need you to be able to produce very specific work, and they'll need you to produce it quickly. Uh, so showing that versatility, showing that range, while still having that consistent through line, uh, showing what interests you, uh, is, uh, is going to be very important. And then, um, so consistency of quality, uh, you know, every piece should be good. And the reason is because if I'm scrolling through a portfolio and I'm going, oh, that's great, that's great, oh, God, what happened there? That's great, that's great. I'm gonna get hung up on the, oh, God, what happened there? Not because I'm a jerk, but because it raises two questions. First of all, did you think that this piece was as good as the others? Because if you did, it makes me question how objective you are regarding your work. Or alternatively, were all of the great pieces just accidental successes that you may or may not be able to uh, produ reproduce? Uh, which means that in either case, your art director, storyboard director would have to uh, micromanage your, your process, which they simply won't have the time to do. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of uh, relatability, uh, just make sure that it's what Mark was saying, uh, you know, your style should uh, should be versatile because I need to be able to see if I'm looking for somebody to work on, you know, as a character designer on SpongeBob, I need to see that they can produce work that exhibits that sort of sensibility. It doesn't have to look exactly like SpongeBob, but if you're giving me a bunch of post-apocalyptic space labs with, you know, slimy creature designs, I'm going to go, this is absolutely great for, you know, for Blizzard Entertainment, probably not right for SpongeBob. And then in terms of animation, you know, the, the, you can basically all weight and timing is it's that translates across any character whether you're animating a you know salt and pepper shaker or a, a person um, so that is really looked at uh, closely when for animation when you're applying for jobs there um, in terms of storyboarding you know it's always just a good sense of uh, a sense of the rules of storyboarding and also a sense of composition and layouts um, and a lot of that will be reflected in your artwork as well um, Storyboarding, I'd say if there was a job that I would, like if one of you were my child, I would push you in the storyboarding direction because all directors hunt them down. They are wanted everywhere. Uh, they're hard to find because most of them, if they're good, they move on and become directors. So the storyboard population continues to drop because they become directors. Storyboarding from a recruiting perspective is the hardest position, bar none, to staff for in animation. And it's also, if on any given production, there might be maybe two, at most three, character designers, uh, there will be six or more yeah. board artists, plus board directors, plus revisionists. So there are a lot of opportunities um, in storyboarding. And for those of you who are interested in, um, in traditional animation, which I know we don't do a ton of in the States, Storyboarding is a great is great for that as well because as we as an industry sort of move away from X sheets and rely a lot on animatics and boards for the timing, boarding has really become like keyframe animation. Yeah, definitely. Right. <laughs> and you will if you're a good board artist, you will never not have job offers. I know ever. that ever. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so anyway, not to discourage those of you who want to be viz dev artists, that's what I was. <laughs> and um, I did a little bit of boarding, but that wasn't my strength. So there's tons of careers in, uh, in uh, design as well. But just know that if you do have a propensity towards boards, 
uh, or animation, definitely consider that. Um, I think we had a question right here. We're recording, uh, so uh, do wait for the microphone because we'd like to be able to hear your questions in the recording. Um, I'm interested in the, in the idea of storyboard artists being so in demand because that's, I think that's cool, you know? Because um, I see myself as one. Uh, but awesome. I was wondering, you know, why is that? Because there's so many great artists out there, you know? What are some of those qualities, aside from being versatile in your style and stuff like that? If you're going, if I were going to show you my portfolio, right? Exactly what what will a good storyboard artist look like to you? Yeah, let's let's hear it from a director's perspective first, then I'll tell you from a recruiting perspective. So it's you know there's also there, it's the art itself and whether it has energy in it. You know, there's you've seen some boards that have low energy, but on other drawings, which usually are scribbles and they're high energy, it's that plus the ability to know when to cut and all the rules for uh, storyboarding, when to go in for an uh, emotional moment, when to stay wide. It's, it's really taking the script and all the unwritten pieces that are in that script, getting those across visually. Because you're basically, it's like illustrating a book, but it's over a timeline. So it's not somebody just turning the pages. So there's all these rules, whether you jump the line, you have to, the 180 rule, there's all these things that you, you have to know as well, and then it takes timing as, on top of that. So there's several different factors that go in. And you know, if, you get, if you have all three of those things with that energy in those uh, drawings, then that's, that's really you know, that's what I look for. My, the best border artist that I have working for me now, his drawings aren't great. They're really expressive, but their energy is, is it's great. It, you can almost kind of see it animate. When it has that, you know, it's a quick drawn line, and it it really it shows you the movement, and he can cut real well too, so it's great. <laughs> I think one of the best things you can do uh, for yourself as a storyboard artist is to actually study some of the traditional principles of just cinematography, uh, whether they pertain to animation or live action. I mean, however you're getting it, the rules are the same. You know, cut on action. Uh, you know, if someone's having a strong emotion or if there's some sort of detail, like cut in closer, you know, establish your shot. And then if there's an emotion, let us get be in there for the emotion. These, these principles that were developed in the very early 20th century, uh, bless you, um, I, uh, it's, it's, it's important because these rules hold true, even, you know, whether you're doing the silliest, wackiest, you know, uh, most ridiculous Tex Avery type show, um, if you're doing um, an awesome, sweet, you know, pretty, uh, you know, preschool show, uh, if you're doing something very serious, those kind of rules remain the same. And I think um, what I see lacking a lot uh, with um, with uh, with talent that still hasn't had studio experience, which is why I think we want to come here to make sure that you guys can be ahead of the curve, is. Um, the awareness of the camera is quite often lacking. Quite often people are uh, presenting boards where um, the camera's just panning left, right, up, down, truck in, truck out, but it's not doing uh, anything more cinematic than that. And that's not to say that every sequence in your portfolio is gonna call for a super cinematic uh, camera, but if you can show that you haven't forgotten that the camera is as much a player as the characters, uh, then that's that's going to be key. That's always the third component that people leave out because you need the acting. That's that's the paramount thing is the acting. You need the action, the mechanics of it, and then uh, and then the camera. Yes, but in the three D world, this new the last ten years, people just move the camera because just because they can. Right, <laughs> right. Which gets a little. It takes away from a lot of things. Like I'm not a big Michael Bay flying camera through a building over a <laughs> yacht. <laughs> it's it's again. I will stress. It's um, you either see too much of it or too little of it. Right. So you know, do yeah. it when it's appropriate. Do it and and it's you decide if it's appropriate. It's your story. It's the story you're telling. Um, if you're if you're showcasing sequences um, in your in your storyboard portfolio, um, don't give me your whole short film. You can have like. Um, another page where you have like your shorts that I can actually watch, but um, I don't know. I will, uh, you know, for Mark. I don't know. Tell me uh, how how long you get to review a portfolio. It might be longer because you already get like a 
selected cut of right. portfolios. Yeah, yeah it, it, it comes, it's gone through people before it gets to me. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it's, it takes no time, honestly. I can tell you by looking at it, whether it's an animator or I, I can tell within the first 10 seconds of the, the clip whether the person has what is needed. Yeah. Um, in terms of art, it takes a little bit longer, but animation, you know, it, it's pretty much right off the bat. Just make sure your demos aren't 16 minutes long or anything yeah. like that. It's, it's, don't give us, the, don't give us every short film because um, I'm sort of that, I'm the front line, I make the cut that will then go to somebody like Mark. So I'm looking at a lot of portfolios every day. Um, thankfully I've, I've, I'm a trained artist, I've worked as a storyboard artist and a vis dev artist, I've been a recruiter for a while, so I have this trained eye, I know what I'm looking at, I can make the appraisal fairly quickly, but even then I can only give myself 30 to, you know, 30 to 40 seconds per portfolio total. So, um, because then I have to move on. Uh, so if you're showing me a three minute short film, I'll watch a part of it and then all I'll see is, is that part of that short film. So give me shorter sequences, um, and again, if you're if you're showing a sequence uh, that you've taken from a, a larger project, make sure that that sequence still makes sense out of the context of that project. So if you're if you're like this is a great shot that showcases you know really funny acting, but it doesn't really make sense without the the context, you know, add a panel to the beginning, add a panel to the end uh, to make it make sense. Uh, more, I think there was a question right back there, and it's hard to see that guy, so I'm worried. To, about leaving him out. Uh, hi. hi. When you're looking at portfolios and you're skimming through, what are some of the things that you look at and you just think, wow, what's that? Uh, do you see that often? And if so, what are those things? Yeah, Mark? Uh, for me, it's character design. Anything that kind of, uh, you know, there's some really great character designers that have you know, styles that you haven't even seen on TV yet. Uh, that's some of the stuff that I really uh, respond to the most is, is character design. Yeah, same. When somebody does, when somebody's presenting a style both in the mechanics and in the visual style that I, that I haven't seen before, but it's also not so off the wall that I right. don't know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah. um, because I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you right now, and I don't want to deflate anybody here, but I'll tell you what I see a lot of are uh, like Brittany Lee style character designs and anime style character designs. Um, so neither of which is bad, they're both amazing. Um, but it's very, the, the, the applicant pool is very, very saturated with that. So that won't help you stand out. Um, on top of which for Nickelodeon, um, we don't really do anime. So um, it, doesn't, it just doesn't help um, showcase what you can do uh, for us. Um, so yeah, when you're doing something out of the box, but it's still got appeal, that's really great. I agree. Yeah. Hi, for the, um, the storyboard portfolio, um, I guess I'm confused as to what specifically you want to see, like, do you want to see something animated or do you want like stills of cells or whatever? Um, well, it would be, the, you know, like, so let's say you made a short and it's gone all the way through completion. If you're, you're interviewing for, or applying for a storyboard position, it would just be the storyboard. You may want to send the animatic. That's an easier way to look at the board. Uh, and it will have the camera moves and everything else in there included. Um, but it would be just that. It would be the, the board or the animatic. Um, okay. If you had VO, things like that, the animatic would be better. If, I mean, you could just, a lot of people that uh, apply to me for storyboard jobs, it's just a PDF with the script underneath it. Um, and usually it's expressive enough that, that I can tell, I can, you know, I, it's like kind of like reading a book, just in a kind of a different way. Would we make up our own or would we like make up our own story, I mean? You could take anything. You could take just take a, a one of your favorite moments from a Bugs Bunny cartoon, that gag. Throw in your own characters and board it appropriately. Yeah, I, I don't recommend fan art, um, so I wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, take a Bugs Bunny situation and make it your own character. Um, the reason being, there's a very real reason, um, is uh, there's certain things that 
I don't know, uh, like rules about drawing Bugs Bunny or about drawing SpongeBob just because, by the way, I'm, not, I'm only harping on SpongeBob because it's like the first word that comes into my head. Um, but there, there's, uh, there are rules to drawing certain characters that I would never know, uh, having been in the industry as long as I have, uh, simply because I've never worked on that show. And if your portfolio gets to somebody who has gone through that training and has gone through that learning curve and has been drawing that character over and over, uh, that person won't be able to help but see the mistakes that you and I and any of us will inevitably make, and it'll automatically sort of prejudice them against your work involuntarily, not because they're bad people, but they'll just start seeing the mistakes. So if you present your own characters, perhaps in the style, like in the visual style with the right line weight and all that, that could live in the same world as Bugs Bunny or in the same world as, you know, uh, Bubble Guppies or, uh, then, then um, that's, that's gonna be much more successful. In terms of presentation, um, it's always good to try to adhere as closely as possible to what studios are actually doing and what's the way storyboards are pitched now, um, from what I've seen, correct me if, if, if it's different with you guys, is more of a slideshow presentation than in the past when it was like many boards and you're like poking at them. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you present an online portfolio that's got like, you know, five panels across, you know, across four panels down, totally fine. Like that, I don't have a bias against that. But it'll be more successful if you can uh, do like a slideshow thing where I can, it's either an animatic or where I can click through one panel at a time. Just if you're doing that, make sure your file size is small enough so that there isn't a million year buffer in between frames. And please don't dissolve from one frame to the next, just have it click from one to the next. Uh, also, <clears throat> excuse me, about the gag, it could be anything. Like you could take a moment here where somebody gets up to go to the bathroom and they trip and fall and then somebody catches their cup and then they end up, you know, it's any moment like that that shows your ability to tell a story. You know what I mean? It, whether, regardless of what that story is, you know, it, it could be the conversation we're having now. Oh, so many hands. Um, this guy, because he's got a cool hairdo, yeah. <laughs> I'm very jealous, I could never pull it off. Thank you. <laughs> um, so pertaining to animation and showing animation reels, um, what would you say you look for the most to just like make the cut and show specific um, like acts or uh, just showing movement in particular? What would be the best to show? Uh, like the best mechanics and the best acting? Like uh, what's yeah, gonna like showcase acting that best? Or I'll yeah, I mean, to the a straight movement, you know, like walk cycles, run cycles, uh, any kind of action-y type thing is always good. Acting is huge, because a majority of these shows, a majority of a 22-minute cartoon is not action. It's not people running around and, you know, throwing rocks and things. It's mostly acting and changes in expression, uh, line of action, weight, you know, body language, all that stuff is, is part of the acting. Um, so those are really things that you, you need to look for. Even if it's weight, like if you took us, my weight is on my elbow. It's little things like that. I'm not here, it's, you know, hello. Like not, there's a whole, <laughs> and that also goes into the, the storyboarding. You know, it would, th that's the kind of stuff that I look for in storyboarding. You're taking a small moment where it's just someone sitting in a chair talking and you're giving it weight and expression and everything else. It's, um, I, I feel like, Acting is about being human, right? And we're um, we're driven by. Has anybody here taken an acting class? Yeah, a few people. I highly recommend it. Yes. Um, I come from a theater background. I did my bachelor in acting, so uh, I'm a little <laughs> biased. But um, acting is about you have you have an intention, you have a goal. Bless you, and you uh, and you have an obstacle in the way to getting that goal, and you are trying a tactic to overcome the obstacle. And when that tactic doesn't work, you stop, you think, you consider, and you pick and you decide on a new tactic. That's all that acting is. So it could be as simple as my goal could be I need to lift this bottle. And what'll make it very human is like the details in the mistakes because we're not perfect. So as opposed to having an animation that's maybe easier and less taxing on you, that's like I reach down and I pick it up with no problems, like what if I like you know, just feel around for it and don't really grab it right the first time. You know, little little details that just make it make it human. Make sure that when uh, 
when a character has a reaction, you don't just cut on the reaction already happening. Give them a second to be in one state of mind to process the realization and then have that, that reaction, right? It's when we think and when we change a state, that's, that's really human. Yeah, I mean, you all are actors. You just, you have a pencil or a mouse. So it, I would really suggest taking acting classes, even if you sit in on them, because uh, that was me. I'm too petrified, <laughs> or I would have been an actor. Uh, but it is, you're acting with a pencil, uh, and you need to be able to do it well uh, and draw it well. I'll also digress, so long as we're talking about like what's good to include in your portfolio and um, to get into the nitty gritty. Uh, for any of you guys who are into uh, design, um, you know, layouts, characters, props, um, don't forget about the the day-to-day -day things. You see so many portfolios that, that have all these fantastical, really cool uh, elements, but look at almost any show, and um, not any show, but a, a large number of shows, even if the meat of the show takes place in some cool sci science-y or fantastical kind of realm, quite often the bookends of the episodes start on a suburban street or in a city, in someone's apartment. So don't forget that in your prop design portfolio, you can have lamps and sandwiches and you know everything that's day to day and try to make that funny and interesting and compelling in a new and different way. Um, yeah. Oh, and don't forget that there's there's like the fun part of design, which is you know you get to come up with something completely new for the first time. And then there's the technical side of the job, which should also be reflected in your portfolio. You're not just, as a designer in animation, you're not just working to create a, a nice picture. You have a responsibility to the person who comes after you in the production pipeline. So you have to, in your portfolio, indicate an awareness of who that person is and what their job is. So if you're a character designer, the next person after you, um, if it's on a CG show, it's the modeler. Uh, and the rigor, they have to know certain things. They have, you have to show uh, the, um, you know, the different expressions. And you know, if a character has a tiny little button mouth, but when he screams, uh, it stretches and occupies half his face, that's gonna be very important for the person building the rig to know that, he, that there need to be enough polygons for that mouth to be able to stretch successfully that far, right? Um, and you have to be able to do a successful turnaround uh, either 180 degrees with like seven poses or uh, five poses uh, or 360 if your character is not fully symmetrical um, so that the modeler or animator knows exactly um, what that character looks like. By the way, the, the turnaround, if you have one really, really clean line uh, drawing in your portfolio, that should be the turnaround. I see a lot of sketchy turnarounds. The turnaround's really like the blueprint for the animator, so that should actually be the clean part of your portfolio, if everything else is sketchy, as far as I'm concerned. More questions? Uh, right next to, we'll get to you next. Hi, um, I had a question about um, making portfolios for different uh, parts of animation. So like if you don't have a like a very, very specific specialty yet, should you have a different portfolio for your character design versus your biz dev stuff? Or like, what can you do if you feel like a generalist and you want to find your niche? So it's kind of like two questions, but yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, well, I mean, <clears throat> you have to think about your audience. So if you're doing a general portfolio, you'd want to put in preschool friendly and then action and, and, and the shows like SpongeBob and Loud House and things like that. If you're covering all those bases for like a general type of Submit, I think that's, that's, that's a good way to think, is think about your audience. Uh, that's also another, in terms of storyboarding, you always have to keep your audience in mind, who, who they are. Yeah. Um, that's big. Um, I would say, uh, this was my issue when I was finishing my grad program, and I was, I was also a generalist. I was boarding, I was designing, I was doing you know, modeling. Um, uh, my suggestion would be don't limit yourself, showcase all of those things, but when you're building your website, your portfolio website, um, have your home page, and then within that have like nested sub pages, you know, and don't break them down by project, break them down by discipline. So here are my character designs, here are my, you know, storyboards, here are my layouts. Character designs can include props as well, layouts can include props as well. Um, but just separate it out by discipline, and then when, if you're applying for a character design position that I've posted, send me the link to 
www.myportfolio.com slash character designs. Take me directly to the page that I'm interested in seeing. And then if I have the time and the, uh, and the inclination, I can click around and see what else you've got there. But I'll really appreciate that with my limited time, you sent me directly to what I'm looking for in that moment. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, I promise this gentleman here. Hello. Um, there are all these stories of these really good artists that, for one reason or another, didn't make the cut. Um, so, do you think there are any like non-art skills that are not um, as valued as there should be? Well, you, you're a part of a team, um, it, so you have to be kind of a team player. Um, everybody has their role on production. You have to take direction, and a lot of artists don't like taking direction. <laughs> Um, you get used to it, but you have to remember that you're, 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 it's an assembly line. You know, the pipeline is basically just an assembly line and you fit in your piece of it, whether it be character design or boards or editor or sound designer, any of those people, um, you, you kind of just have to realize that you're part of a team. I think that is part of it with some of the artists that, that just don't play well with others. Um, what else? Well, there's, you know, there's all just regular job things like being on time, you know, working the full day, things like that. People can get distracted pretty easy, so that's another part of it. Yeah, I um, sometimes the people who make it the biggest didn't start out with the most amount of talent, but they had the the most tenacity and the and the biggest drive, and um, and that'll go a long way. I mean, I have a policy when I recruit, uh, which is I don't hire brilliant jerks. <laughs> You know, um, because you get one person that's not, uh, you get one person that's like a genius, um, but he will demoralize the rest of the team. Everybody will quit that show and nobody else will want to go on that show because it'll get a bad reputation. Um, I'd rather not hire that person as great as his individual contribution may be uh, stylistically. I would rather hire somebody who's only 90% as good as he is and have a team that works really well together, exactly what Mark was saying. Um, but I think... There are people who, you know, not because they were jerks and not because they didn't have a good drive, um, but sometimes, uh, you know, it's a matter of luck and it's a matter of networking. There's there's a huge element of networking and meeting people that goes into um, into sort of building your career. I wonder if this might actually be a good opportunity for us to sort of talk about how how we came up and and maybe that'll uh, that'll either inspire. Or, or uh, embarrass, inspire you or embarrass us. Uh, <laughs> Want to start, Mark? Would that be uh, interesting to sure. you guys? Yeah? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, I did not go to school for animation or art or anything. I have a degree in criminal justice. <laughs> <clears throat> I, was a, I was a scholarship athlete, so I, I, did, I was accepted to RISD and the art schools, but I, you know, it was, my dad was like 65000 a year or free. So... I went on to play and uh, get a degree in criminal justice. After that, I was a coach. Uh, I coached at Yale football. Um, and while I was there, I decided to make my own film. And this was on cell, you know, cell painted uh, relationship between a chipmunk and a monster truck. So from after I made that, I shopped it around. I would go anywhere, just knock on doors. Um, and eventually I got hired at a small, like boutique animation place in the city and then lasted there for a while and then went to a place up in Connecticut where I did Animaniacs and Quest for Camelot CD-ROM games, which probably none of you ever had. <laughs> yes. uh, and then from there, I, I, I submitted to go work on Little Bill, which was in 98 um, and got hired by Nick. So, you know, it was, it was not your normal road for sure. I'd always drawn and I, you know, doodled. Animation was always something that I wanted to do. I did so many flip books in the corner of my textbooks and things like that. Um, I studied, my, my Bible basically was the Preston Blair book, um, which is why it's tattooed on my arm. Uh, and so really that's, that's kind of, and it was just hard work. And it was also, it was so new to me that I kept, I was like a sponge. I kept just taking in more and more information as I went. Like, you know, when I taught last year here, I was so jealous of all of you. <laughs> I wanted to be in classes and making my own films and things like that, because I didn't, I didn't really have that. You know, because I've been doing this for a long time, but I'm not really telling my stories. I'm telling someone else's stories the best, I, best way I can. 
So this is a time when you guys get to kind of make your own shows and, and have your own voice and then go on to either someday hopefully get your own series, which I'm still hoping for. It'll happen. <laughs> It'll happen. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I went to, I, I grew up in San Francisco and I had always been drawing. I had a very classical art background. My mom's from Russia, so when I showed a knack for it, she said, this won't just be fun, this will be serious. And uh, <laughs> so it was, you know, like uh, three hour classes, five days a week after school, uh, very classical sort of Renaissance principles of art. Um, and at the same time, uh, Disney was going through its whole renaissance. This was in the late 80s, early 90s, and I was like, I'm going to go into animation. And then when I was in high school, I got really into acting, and so I kind of switched, and I was still drawing, but I decided I was going to be an actor. I went down to UCLA to, be, to study acting, got my degree in that, uh, did that for a couple of years, uh, and you know, it kind of concluded for me the way it concludes for most of the 250,000 people who come to LA every year to be actors. And um, and a friend of mine who had gone through the theater program with me who had uh, focused more on production and had sort of pivoted her career to do production in animation, she was at Disney uh, Feature and working on The Princess and the Frog and uh, Prep and Landing and Tangled. And she said, why don't you sort of requalify and, uh, and go into animation? You draw well. So I did that. Uh, I went back to UCLA um, to their film program. And... Um, and at that point, I just got lucky. I've, I think be, probably because of sort of just a natural proclivity towards, uh, I, I like to think of myself as fairly gregarious and you know, I like to ch chat people up. Um, so it's, it's, I think that was one quality that sort of set me apart was I, um, I never hesitated to ask a question. It's not any easier for me than for anybody else. I still get nervous. I still, as I'm, if I'm approaching somebody like Mark and I'm like, oh God, I really love what he does. And, I still have to work myself up, but at the end of the day, I always remind myself that I could either do it or not do it, and if I do it, he could either be you know, super gracious and give me his time and you know, talk to me about what he does, and maybe I can build a relationship, or he might end up being a complete jerk and say, get the hell out of my face, and then the worst that's happened is I'm still where I, where I was, you know? Um, and where Mark would never do that. But, um, but I, fig I always remind myself that the worst that could happen, the absolute worst, is I could end up exactly where I still am, where I already am, right? So, you know, take the risk. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, if you don't ask the question, you have a 100% chance of a no. But if you ask the question, you might get a no, you might get a yes. So um, that's sort of the policy that's driven me. And um, I applied that when I was in school. I would just reach out to everybody I could find in animation. I just made this blanket assumption that everyone's, uh, email address was just first name dot last name at company name dot com, which much of the time is accurate. <laughs> Sorry, I know this is being recorded. <laughs> Sorry, colleagues. Um, but no, but it's, I mean, you know, so I would just like shoot emails and, you know, and I, um, the first mistake that I made um, was my, my first emails, which never got responses, were way too long. I kind of, I would work myself up and I'd go, this is my one chance to reach out to this person. I've got to make the best impression. I know I write well, so I'm going to just use the most flowery language, and I'm going to tell them about myself. And I would write this novel. I mean, it was like Dickensian, this you know, whole thing that I'd send them. Um, and, uh, and I wouldn't get responses. And having worked on the other end of it now, getting you know, about uh, 60 emails per hour, um, <laughs> all of which I have to respond to. Uh, it's very refreshing when you get an email that's just a couple of lines, gets directly to the point you can respond to right away. And then the emails that are huge, I just feel bad because I know from my own experience how much this person poured into this email and I just, I, I just physically can't get to it. I'll flag it for later with every intention and it's just not gonna happen and 30 days later our Viacom policy is that our emails disappear if we don't back them up. So that's what'll happen. So. I got wise to that, started writing short emails that would get responses. Um, and I also didn't just network up with people that were already established. I made sure to network with my, with my friends that I was in school with. That's not even networking, that's just being friendly. And the first job I got in animation was a you know, colleague of mine, a, student, a fellow student who got a job in a very small uh, animation studio and they needed another person and she recommended that they hire me. Um, and so without a test, they just brought me on. 
And that was somebody who wasn't above me on the food chain. It was someone who was exactly on a lateral level. And that's how I got my start. Mine was much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right there. Hi. So um, let's say you're in, right? And you started working uh, in a certain position. So my question is, how flexible is the transition between one position to the other? So let's say you guys keep saying, like, if you're good, then eventually you get to production, right? So so how far does that saying kind of, you know, like stretch? So let's say you get in as a, um, a modeler. So, so if you're really good and like you have a knack for that, is it even possible to kind of eventually get to that like other side of the spectrum, which is more like production and like stuff like that? Yes, I would say get in any way you can. It's so much easier to navigate your path from within a studio than from the outside. I, I um, look for internships, look for anything, do anything. Honestly, I, I, I'm thinking about a very particular person who interned for us and we really liked him because he had a great attitude and we said, we want to keep you on, but the only opening we have right now is in the mail room. Will you take that? And he said, I'll do anything. And we hired him in the mail room and six months later, we promoted him to a production assistant and now he's going on to be a production coordinator. Um, and then if he wants, he can do like an internal mentorship program and uh, hone in on some uh, artistic skills. And if, if he's good, he can transfer to story or modeling or whatever the case may be because he's inside, he knows these people and everybody likes him. And so everybody wants to give him a chance. Um, and that makes all the difference. Yeah, I, knowing how to do as many things as you can is really, really helpful. I've done, I think, every job on the production side, not in the management side, but the production side. I've been cleanup, uh, you know, 2D cleanup. I've been a background designer, character animator, character designer. You, and I worked my way up to where I was an assistant director, and then I started directing my own shows. Then I started, you know, directing my own shows as being a, a storyboard supervisor. Then I didn't like working with editors because as a director, it's really kind of time consuming. Give me more A-frames that way. You know, that, so I learned how to edit. And so I edited the entire Bubble Guppies series myself, which was so much faster than sitting with an editor. So just knowing how to do all those things, it's always good. Because let's say you were working with me on Bubble Guppies, and you were about to wrap out. But there was an open position for a storyboard revisionist. If I knew you could do it, I'd be like, let's just move you over to this. So really knowing, and also, Knowing how all the pieces fit together is, is good to know. A lot of people, uh, a lot of production people don't really know where their stuff goes and where it ends up. So it's, it's good to have that knowledge. Right here? Oh, right there. One of you. Um, forgive me for backtracking, but if we could go back to getting in in the first place. Yeah. Um, you said that it was like helpful, or like one of the things that you really look for is like the ability to do teamwork and things like that. So, what is the feeling of like having collaborative projects on your portfolio, like having things that you've worked on with other people there, or is it is it bad to just include something like that since it's got other input in it? So long as on your reel you can you know put in a little uh, uh, text that specifies exactly what your contribution was, so that I can appraise that. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I love seeing stuff like that. Yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah. Can I have one more? Sure. OK. <laughs> um, there are no rules. Just, what is, um, just, I was curious as to what like some of the like more interesting or like new forward media kind of things that you've seen in portfolios lately. Cool. I haven't seen a portfolio in a while. So I think this is your question. Um, you know. It's uh, that's an interesting question. I don't know that I. Uh, I mean, when I'm when I'm staffing for for CG, you know, just I mean, obviously being that's that's where the cutting edge really is, and like staying up to date, um, you know, with uh, with uh, with two D, you know, make there's you know there's software there that you should know, um, Harmony and all of the Toon Boom sort of um, elements are are sort of what. 
um, much of the industry is using now, Nickelodeon certainly, you know, uh, Storyboard Pro um, is something that would be good to know. Uh, you know, obviously Photoshop, um, Maya, ZBrush, uh, if you're into CG, um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're editing and rendering, then knowing um, Premiere is really becoming big at the expense of Final Cut, because Final Cut wanted to become more of a, a catch-all for like the YouTubers, right? Yeah, we st I, I used Final Cut 7 and uh, through Bubble Guppies, but the new show is done in Premiere. They're, they're pretty much pushing, because Final Cut 7 was still like the pro version of Final Cut, because Final Cut 10 is basically like iMovie, you know? Uh, yeah. So it's not real, you know, production friendly. And if you're, um, and that, so we would use Premiere for like animatic editing. If you're doing final picture editing, we use the Avid. Um, and There's uh, Flame, Flame and Nuke and all the, the post uh, color correction, things like that. If you're into, into audio, then obviously Pro Tools. Um, so in that, I mean, that's all technology, but in terms of techniques, um, honestly, I don't need it to be radical or revolutionary. If it's, if it's good, uh, you know, if it's just fun um, and there aren't elements that detract from the fun, you know, like bad acting or, or even just weak acting um, or uh, a sort of a lapse in anatomy when you've... Anatomy, by the way, doesn't have to be human anatomy. I mean, I'll go back to SpongeBob, right, because that's my crutch today. Um, but, uh, you know, SpongeBob, uh, sometimes you have to design SpongeBob looking over his shoulder, and how do you do that when his head, his neck, and his torso are all one thing, you know? You have to figure that out, right? So, um, so even just coming up with fun ways to do that, um, it doesn't have to be radical. Um, but when I do see something that's really out there um, and that can still have mass appeal, I think that's the trick is um, you, when you're in school, this is really a time when you can, you know, make a project that's the, that's an unadulterated you, right? And you want to take advantage of that, but also know that if you know studios, we are uh, we are making um, a product for um, for mass consumption, and we need it to have an element of of marketability and of mass appeal. And so while we do try to push the limit. Um, we we can't go, you know, it can't look like the first segment of Fantasia all the time. And um, uh, if that reference still holds. Uh, and um, and so it's, it's about, you know, you just have to know when you're putting together your portfolio in school if your goal is to be an independent uh, filmmaker or if it's to work for the studio. And if it is to work for a studio kind of, um, you know, Go on IMDb and click around and see what that's you know what artists who work at that studio in the types of jobs that you would like to have are doing, and um, and really you know make sure that you're creating a portfolio that will compete. Did that answer your question? Great. Uh, there was somebody right there in the striped shirt. Hello. Hi. Um, you were mentioning earlier how one of your interns worked their way up to position of production coordinator. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to become a production coordinator without having to go through the system and work your way up? Like, how would you apply for that? Well, th that a production coordinator is something that you kind of, you know, you start as maybe a production manager or an assistant. Like on Bubble Guppies, uh, our assistant who was just the executive assistant is now associate producer um, and then going back even farther uh, a previous executive assistant is now executive producer of the new show so it, it, it the management side of things is really kind of growing from within um, you start somewhere I mean unless you go let's say you go to some other uh, show and then you're applying you would you maybe you were a production manager on that that production, but now you you're applying for a new position for a coordinator. But there would need to be some sort of history uh, experience there for you to, to to land that job. Yeah, it, it is really a it's a driven by doing. You know, it's not you, you can't out of college. You're not going to have production coordinating experience on your own. You are, 
um, but it, it, it doesn't really uh, cross, that's a growing position. Yeah, I would say, um, I'll just break down for you sort of what are the most t standard sort of entry level roles, right? Um, uh, at Nick uh, f for my office in Burbank for our studio. Um, production assistant is a great way to enter the studio, but if you've interned, you have a little bit of a leg up because part of our internship program is really, we do try to retain our interns. We have the highest rate of, uh, from among any animation studio, of staffing our interns um, within a couple of years of them having completed their internship. So we're very proud of that. So we, when when an entry level position opens up, I work very closely with our internship manager to make sure that we're giving our, our former interns and current interns uh, first consideration. Now that being said, often um, the pool of interns that we have um, may A, have already been you know, snatched up by other studios, or um, they might have a couple of years left in, in school, or um, maybe they're just not the right fit for that particular team. Um, so often I'll open it up um, to, to the outside. Production assistant is one of the most highly applied to positions, um, more so than storyboard artists, more so than, um, than animators. Production assistant is where you get a ton of applicants. So in order to stand out, just showing in your resume, this is gonna be much more of a resume uh, focused search than a portfolio focused search, showing that you um, have a familiarity with just being organized, um, showing that you have worked in animation um, or productions, um, which by the way, in your resume, if you guys work, and I know you do, uh, on, on long-term projects, semester-long or year-long projects, list those out under your experience. Your experience doesn't, on your resume, doesn't just have to be stuff you got paid for. You know, you wanna specify that this was a student film, thesis film, whatnot, but um, just like any other position, put the title of the film, the, 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 the job title that you had and bullet point out what you did. Um, knowing file transferring softwares, you know, uh, WeTransfer, uh, uh, Dropbox, um, even FileMaker Pro, which we use at the studio. Um, having, you, you don't have to know this stuff extensively, but you know, doing a, a YouTube tutorial and, uh, or a lynda.com tutorial and, um, and just having some kind of basic familiarity with that so that you can list it on your resume will give you a bit of a leg up. Um, and uh, in terms of artistic positions that are a good sort of foot in the door, um, you know, for animation, uh, I would say, is in betweening still? Not really, no, yeah. I haven't recruited for animation in a while. Um, but, um, uh, oh no, what'd you do? I broke What'd you do? Uh, <laughs> that's it, send the check. Uh, so. Uh, that's why we can't have nice things. All right. So um, I would say uh, for storyboarding, um, being a revisionist, um, you know, is, is a good way to start. That can also be a path towards either boards or designs because it does require an element of good draftsmanship and other skills that you would need for design. Um, and then for more painterly stuff, um, color styling. A color stylist is the person who um, determines the color for the, the props and characters as opposed to for the background, which is our painter. Um, and then prop design. Prop design is a great way into design because it's a little harder to take a chance for character design or layouts with somebody who's very green, but props are in every scene. If you mess up on one prop, you know, there's more leeway there because it's not gonna completely destroy a shot. We still have a high standard for you to, for you to meet, but um, I would say uh, uh, make sure you have prop designs um, in your portfolio. If it's a 2D production, you know, there's, there's assistant animators and there's uh, there's guy that do they clean poses so they they'd be cleaning poses onto model from the storyboard um, in terms of like a flash or a, a tomb boom show something like that there's those are the more entry level positions there's lip sync artists that just are handling the entire lip sync for the show for if 2D or 3D uh, and those are you, you'd be surprised that's that's not an easy job um, and it's it's a ton of work yeah. But it's a good way to learn, for sure. Did that answer your question? Great. Thank you. Yeah. How much time do we have, Shang? 11.30. It's 11.30? Like another 10 minutes? Or? Great. Uh, gentleman in the blue shirt. When, apply when applying for a storyboard position, could a portfolio of comic art correlate? Yes. 
but it's good to also have boards. But I would love to see your comics as well, if you have them. What do you think? Yeah, I, but uh, the, make sure there's boards in there. I mean, comic boarding, you know, you're not, comic art doesn't have to follow a set of rules, uh, you know, filmmaking rules. So there's a bunch of leeway with that. It's great to see all the art, but it, we need to see the rules of storyboarding apply as well. Comics are great to show that you can tell a story in a, you know, that you're a sequential artist, right? You can visually tell a story. Um, the, but you can have in one panel a, con, you know, a conversation, like an exchange that goes back and forth five times within one panel. Storyboards, just to get very, very specific, if you have an 11 minute, um, you guys know that episodes are typically 11 or 22 minutes because in a half hour block you allow for eight minutes of commercials. So, um, in an 11 minute episode, so do quick, some quick math, 24 frames, so about 15 to 16,000 frames, right, in that episode. Say you're doing it on twos, so you have about 8,000 pictures, right, on the screen for those 11 minutes. You might have 1,000 storyboard panels for that, uh, for that uh, 11 minute show. So like one out of every eight pictures is actually being boarded out. So really every change in emotion, every change in pose, every change in thought um, really, really has to be boarded out. We're not really seeing a lot of indicating things with arrows a heck of a lot anymore. It's really kind of being, in, I mean, that's still done, but so much of what used to be just indicated is now actually in between. Uh, in the storyboard, so um, it depends on the production too. It depends on the production. If it's in house, we use arrows. Right, right. But uh, yeah, uh, if it's not, if it's being shipped anywhere, you, you you have to be as specific as possible. Yeah, and um, and when it's being shipped, uh, in your storyboard portfolio, I don't always, I don't necessarily recommend that you work super cleanly. But in your portfolio, if you can have one, even just a short board, to show that you can work a little bit more cleanly, um, when you do ship out of house to a vendor studio. Uh, they will quite often demand uh, fairly clean boards from you that are almost like layouts um, because the reason being that um, their animators depend very much on what the boards show and if they send us back animation that we're not happy with, we get into fights over who has to pay for the retake. So, so that's why they tend to be very demanding quite often of... Um, of uh, very clean boards. On a CG show, not as much because you have your models. On a flash type show, not as much because you also have your, your elements already. Um, but on a more traditionally animated show, uh, there will probably be a degree of cleanup on the boards. So showing that you can do that, even if it's just one short sequence in your portfolio, um, would also be help, even if the rest of your portfolio is fairly loose. Still with energy, though. With energy, with energy. Do not lose the energy, yeah. Uh, You were talking about how clean the boards are and like the cleaner ones go shipped out. But for your portfolio, how rough can you go for showing the energy of the, you know, the sequence? Well, you need to be able to know who's who. Okay. Uh, yeah. You'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, emotions need to read clean. Any action needs to read clean. Um, but honestly, there's so many. I mean, I'm sure you guys do gestural drawings and things like that. There's a lot of that in boards. But then you just add a little bit extra. If you've got a hat on, you know, you make sure you, you the scale and layout is or really the things that I harp on the most because if the character scales aren't right, it's then it goes to like if we're doing 3D, then we go to 3D and we're now everybody's the right scale and the layout just doesn't work because the board artist has decided to shrink everybody, you know, it just doesn't work. So it, it can mess up entire sequences once you get to layout. Let's say um, you can go as rough as you as you want with, you know, if you're trying to just go for the energy and get that, you know, if you're like, I'm just gonna Glen Keen this thing, right? It's gonna be all <laughs> yeah. sketchy, right? Um, uh, to, you can go as rough as you want to the point of it not being distracting from, from the story, like Mark was saying. Um, and I think a, a good uh, way to measure that is to um, have someone that you trust to be honest with you, not just a yes man, who is going to give you a very clear appraisal. And when they're reading your board, if they hesitate somewhere, if they go, wait, what? Then they've been taken out of it. So figure out what about that panel took them out of it, um, because you never want that suspension of disbelief to, uh, to be rocked, right? So it can be rough, just so long as it's not 
uh, distracting, you know, yeah, more so than your, than your thumbnail sketches. But um, if it's rough and clear, it's fine. Or a complete stranger. Show it to a complete stranger. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, remember <laughs> that the- They don't know anything. They, they hold nothing for or against you. They'll give you complete honesty. Uh, and most people who watch animation and enjoy animation have, are not animation specialists. That's who our audiences are. So I completely agree with that. I think that's a great piece of advice. We haven't made use of this at all. Is that okay, Shang? I think we have one. Um, oh, sorry, you want? I said, is it okay that we haven't made use of this at all? <laughs> We've kind of talked about everything that's in there, so it's. <laughs> um, I think we only have time for one last question. Okay. So you um, have to pick wisely. Uh, <laughs> the gentleman right there. I know. It's the closest. Hi. 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 Hello. Um, I wanted to know. I know you guys both have experience in uh, the production side of things and the creative side. Um, I want to know if you can talk about the experiences between those two worlds and how. Um, it worked to your advantage knowing both of those things. Um, well, I, I, I understand, I, like knowing the production side, I understand why some things can't be done. There's costs associated with everything. So if I want to blow up something and it's just not, it's too expensive, um, it affects how boards are done because you can board in a way to cheat animation or cheat away from props that you're not going to see or need to see. Um, you know, I, the, the production side of thing. I ran my own studio for a few years, and that, it was extremely frustrating dealing with the money that would come in and how I had to d distribute it appropriately and all that. Um, that's why I left that part of it now, just direct. Uh, the, the, there is always going to be kind of... Uh, you know, you're butting heads with production uh, from the creative because, no, I want that explosion. And they're like, well, you can't have it. <laughs> so there's, that's always going on. Um, in terms of effects, it's a lot, that, that happens with a lot of effects. You know, like to sweeten a show after it's finished, let's sparkle everything and they, you know, you get six shots. Okay. That's pretty much my, my experience between production and then the creative side. I think, Anybody, you know, quite often you'll get an opportunity to take an internship or get a starting job that's more production based, like to do more production assistant type work. And um, a lot of people might not go for that because their pursuits are creative, and that was the case for me. Um, but you, exactly what Mark was saying, you learn so much. As a production assistant, part of what you're doing is it's called breaking down the boards. And that means that when you receive a storyboard, you break it down to understand, okay, based on what the storyboard artists have given, we need to know what characters, how many extra characters, how many, like what are the props, so that you can assign this to the prop designers and the character designers and the layout artists. And going through that process as a production assistant and understanding how the types of boards that are drawn or the types of scripts that are written are going to affect the schedule and the budget, um, then when you leave production and decide to be a storyboard artist, and you go, I have this great concept for this story where they're going to go to the mall um, and you know and have a you know a field day there or whatever. Um, you start thinking, okay, well, going to the mall, that's a setting that we haven't used before, which means that the exterior of the mall, every interior of the mall, from multiple angles, and all of the shops in that mall, and all of the people who populate that mall, and all of the voices in that mall, it's all going to have to be cast and drawn, and that's really, really expensive. And there are certain episodes that typically are given that kind of bigger budget, like the Christmas episode or you know the, the uh, Halloween episode. So you say, okay, maybe I'll save this concept for that episode. And then this episode, I'll like, I'll retain the the story that I want, but maybe I'll s keep it in the house where we already have all of this designed. You start to get very smart about designing and boarding um, in cost-effective ways because being a professional in this industry is not just about being an artist. It's about it's about being the kind of artist that can um, help the process be uh, efficient um, and economical, um, which I know doesn't sound like the sexiest thing, you know, for creatives who who don't want their their creativity to be um, to be sort of it's bound by anything. Yeah, but it's an art in itself. As a board artist, to be able to kind of know when you don't need to show something is just as important as when you do need to show something. And knowing that is a is a it's a 
that's why the board position is a tough one to fill. Working within parameters can actually make you so creative, so creative. Um, so yes, yeah, so I would say that's helped. That's helped me uh, when I was working as an artist, and um, I mean recruiting. It's it, it's helped me obviously because I I um, you know I know what I'm looking for when I'm looking for a PA, and I know what I'm looking for when I'm looking for a storyboard artist. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ariel and, and Mark. Let's give them a round of applause for being here. Thanks.